All right. Hello to everyone. A hello to a bonjour. Um, I'm so excited to um, introduce and, and start this um, virtual presentation of the an inquisitive prince exhibit. We're joined by our partners from the Musée du Quai Branly and the Bibliothèque Municipale de Versailles, and um, they're here, uh, you know, in the exhibit room in the in the Choctaw room. So today we'll hear from our partners and do introductions and then go through a presentation of the exhibit and we'll have time for Q&A at the end, um, about 30 minutes. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Just before we get started to um, sort of frame the project, we uh, contacted the um, Musée du Quai Branly in 2017 to ask about Choctaw items to add to the Choctaw and Pona database. So um, trying to build up a database of Choctaw traditional arts to share with our community. Um, and we kind of started this relationship um, at that time and since then, um, have kind of been able to build that up. And in the last year and a half, we're working on this project via Zoom and email. So kind of from a distance, but it's been a really wonderful collaboration. And so we've selected some items from their Native American collection or North American collections to show in the last room of the exhibit. So we'll walk through the history of the collection and um, why it's at the um, public library in Versailles, and then talk about how we um, are kind of telling the story of the Choctaw French relationship in the 1700s. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it to Katie Shaw, who will introduce um, Choctaw Nation team. Lito and good morning. My name is Katie Shaw and I'm the director of curation for the Choctaw Cultural Center in Durant, Oklahoma. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, this project began years ago and it grew into a curatorial partnership between the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma's Historic Preservation Department, the Choctaw Cultural Center, the Musée de Quebrani's curatorial team, and the Municipal Library at Versailles curatorial team. This collaborative exhibit came at a time when the Choctaw Nation was preparing to open our cultural center, which is a place where we tell a uniquely Choctaw history. Um, this project for the French exhibit started as a consultative relationship and it grew into a really wonderful institution to institution partnership. The Historic Preservation Department of the Choctaw Nation during this process was able to identify and help the Kibali staff understand some of the items in their collections and the Cultural Center was kind of lending a curatorial suggestion on items for the from the collection that would highlight the Choctaw French relations in the 1700s and together all the teams worked cohesively to create a really fascinating exhibit. The Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Department, the Choctaw Cultural Center, and the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma are very proud to have contributed to this exhibit, and we look forward to a continued partnership with the Musée de Quai and the Municipal Library at Versailles. And then we'll have um, the Musée du Quai Branly uh, introduce um, their kind of part of the partnership. Hello, I'm Paz Nunez Regueiro. I'm head curator of the Americas at the Musée du Quai Branly. So I'm very pleased today to um, be here in the name of the Musée du Quai Branly uh, to thank the Choctaw Nation and the Library of Versailles for this beautiful project that we have done together. Uh, I'm here today with two of my colleagues, Nicolas Stolle and uh, Leandro uh, Barrison. Uh, so this uh, project started in the framework of a research project that we um, are um, doing on the royal collections uh, from North America that are held in French institutions. In our museum, we have more than 250 items from North American territories that were collected by French officers and explorers between 1650 and 1850. And they make up an exceptional corpus for understanding indigenous nations and their relations with Europeans. So this research uh, involves French and foreign partners, including the um, public library at Versailles, and it combines a historical study of the collections, a material analysis, and a conservation restoration campaign, and uh, also collaboration, of course, with Native American partners. So in this uh, project, we have 
uh, worked uh, very um, uh, very much with the Choctaw Nation uh, of Oklahoma. And for us, it is really a big honor to uh, have uh, an exhibition in France that um, honors, uh, welcomes the Choctaw Nation uh, for the first time. And now we'll have um, the uh, Versailles Public Library introduce their part of the partnership as well. Uh, so it's my turn. First, I need to apologize for the absence of my colleague Hortense Sonchke, uh, who has worked a lot uh, upon the project. Uh, she's getting married, and it's a good apology <laughs> to be absent. Um, and I introduce you uh, my colleague Emily Cotarel, uh, who uh, is uh, working upon the, the communication about the event. And um, uh, that I have to, to say. <laughs> uh, now, uh, a, a few words about our library. Uh, it's a historical library. Um, look, uh, it is located very near the, the Palace of Versailles, uh, which was um, the king's residence during uh, the old regime and uh, for the um, uh, history uh, concerning uh, the United States, uh, you, you must know that it's in location we have negotiated the Treaty of Independence of the United States of America. Um, but uh, after the revolution, we, the, the building became a library and um, was um, uh, in the same time, a museum, and um, we have conservated uh, during a long time uh, many uh, objects and items um, coming from the royal collections, and especially uh, some of the items which are presented today in our um, exhibition. And uh, the, this exhibition is the first uh, since uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and we are very proud to work with you um, to, to prepare it. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a very good and beautiful exhibition. And a lot of people, a lot of inhabitants of Versailles were very um, uh, happy to, to know about the Choctaw. They didn't know your, your nation, and uh, we just uh, uh, tell them it's, uh, it's a recollection of our uh, last and uh, our old links between France and your nation. Thank you. Um, and I forgot to introduce myself. I am uh, Jennifer Byram in the Historic Preservation in Choctaw Nation. So, um, so that's kind of where where we fit in. And next, we're going to jump into the presentation of the exhibit and um, has will be um, kind of presenting and um, I'll jump in there a little bit. So we'll go ahead and um, move on to the next section. And um, just to, to make sure everyone kind of understands today where we're looking at this exhibit um, and we will have a video in the future. Uh, to show of, of the exhibit, but we'll kind of present present it and give you a tour um, today. And um, it is on, you know, in the public library of Versailles, um, but it's it's kind of this part of this bigger partnership and, and project um, that the museum uh, is working on. So I'll go ahead and pass it to um, Paz. Okay, so I'm very happy today to lead you through the uh, exhibition. Um, we are going to start by showing you uh, the building from the outside. So the, we are here today in the um, Foreign Affairs and Navy premises, uh, which is a building that was built uh, under the King Louis XV in the year six, uh, 1760s. Uh, so it was meant to be a place where uh, all the material linking to foreign affairs and to the Navy were put together to uh, create a more powerful administration and fight for the colonies that France was losing at that time, particularly North American uh, colonies. 
And this building was meant to be also a place very important for diplomatic affairs. So uh, that's why in this building you have this gallery where we are today, which is the gallery of foreign affairs. Uh, it was a gallery where uh, archives linked to that um, uh, foreign affairs were held and all um, eminent foreigners that arrived to Versailles to see the king were brought in this place that is very nicely decorated by big artists of that time and all the decoration points to the glory of France. You have uh, five different rooms. Uh, all covered with shelves of books, like you see uh, here. And so today uh, it's a library. And uh, these are very old collections of books. And this uh, organization is um, done with five rooms, uh, all decorated with different um, paintings representing the cities in France, but also the powerful cities in uh, Spain, in Germany, in Italy, all the uh, uh, imperial forces uh, of that time. But of course, France is in the middle with a big uh, portrait of Ricans that you will see uh, later on. So this is the entrance of the exhibition. Uh, here uh, we are on uh, um, September 16th. It was the opening of the exhibition and we had uh, the press coming in. So here is the entrance and then you go to the I will interrupt myself because. Okay, my colleagues arrived, so it was a bit noise, but now we are done. So we are entering this uh, exhibition. It's the first room. You can see how beautiful this place uh, is. It, it is really in the same state it was in the 18th century. So you can imagine this is one of the most important uh, historical monuments here. Uh, uh, in Versailles and, and in France, and it is really a, hon a big honor to present this collection in this place, uh, since the collection was housed for more than a century in these uh, premises. So the first room um, tells the beginning of the story of the collection we are presenting uh, in the exhibition. The collection is the one that was gathered um, by the Count, Count of Artois, the younger brother of Louis XVI. Uh, in uh, he, uh, we can see it in the next slide. We have a closer look to this uh, prince that was uh, very well known because he liked a lot uh, women and he liked to spend money and he was a big friend of Marie Antoinette. But he also was married uh, to Marie Therese de Savoie, who you will see in the next slide. And they had together uh, four children uh, to a boy. Uh, the Duc d'Angoulême and the Duc de Berry, and the Count of Artois will decide uh, in the year uh, 1785 to start uh, gathering a library and a cabinet of curiosities, uh, that is to say a cabinet with natural uh, history specimens, but also exotic objects to, uh, for the education of his children. It was uh, a habit in uh, big aristocratic families and particularly in the house uh, in the, for the princes uh, of the crown of France to have these uh, cabinets in the 18th century. You also had uh, chemistry and physics uh, instruments and all those um, collections were meant for the education. So in, in this room, we show a variety of items that were held in this collection. And uh, today, the, the, the Count of Artois collection is, um, we can go to the next, next uh, slide, uh, is uh, very well known, has a, a very important reputation because of um, the quality and the number of uh, the objects from all over the world that were gathered for these collections. So you can see on these window cases, uh, physics uh, uh, instruments, also natural history specimens, and for example, this uh, kayak, um, which we can have a closer look on in the next slide, which is a, a very uh, impressive piece, very big. And it is one of the uh, rare specimens that we can clearly identify in the inventory of, that we have of this old collection. It is a very uh, interesting um, piece because um, it was not uh, done by Inuit people. It is, um, um, done by a European um, artist probably that uh, copied what he had seen or what he had read in uh, the scriptures of that time. So uh, in the next uh, um, 
slide, we can see how these items are really old. And sometimes when we are lucky, they still have uh, labels that can help us identify uh, their provenience or at least have an idea of the precise uh, dating. So if we continue with this, um, so here you see uh, these rare uh, documents that we can use to try to figure out where the collection comes from. And in this inventory of 1792, what is very interesting is that um, of the 300 and uh, more than 60 uh, items from all over the world that the collection held, a big majority came from America and in particular, in particular from Canada and Louisiana. And uh, it is evident from uh, the collection and this inventory that all the pieces come from uh, all the places that were colonized at that time by the French uh, people. So we can move forward. So here we arrive to the second room. So you see always the same uh, <laughs> uh, books and, and, and a very nice uh, decoration. Um, and we, we are presenting here some objects that show the variety of provenience of these collections from Comte d'Artois. You, you must uh, gather in mind that the collection of over uh, of 360 pieces was done in less than four years. It is a very short time from 1785 to the revolution. So we think that most of the collections come from other collections that were already held in France. The Prince of Artois um, bought them or asked for them. And uh, we think that a big, um, some of them came from the uh, cabinets of curiosities of the king uh, of France. Obviously, the Count of Artois could have asked his brother, Louis XVI, for uh, some items. So, in the next slide, you can see one of the most important um, aspects of these collections, which is the collection of um, painted hides from the plains. Here you have one very beautiful specimen that shows uh, calumets, and uh, the collection of Count d'Artois um, had 18 of those. And those were very precious uh, items that were really uh, reserved for very prestigious peoples. When you look at them, you see that they have very little uh, traces of wear. So one can uh, understand that those pieces were probably done for exchange and were probably um, uh, gifts given uh, during uh, diplomatic exchanges or exchanges between uh, native um, uh, American nations and uh, French people. On the uh, next slide, you can have a closer look to this uh, beautiful specimen. So I know this item is very, <laughs> was interested a lot, uh, our Choctaw team uh, partners. So I don't know, Jennifer, if you wanted to add something about this. No, at this point, okay. <laughs> so um, to, uh, oh, oh, just briefly. Um, so uh, as Paz um, mentioned, there were a, a number of different hides um in the collections and um uh, there were some kind of from the southeast we were interested in um but just to kind of um this hide represents you know the calumet pipes and and the you know the pipe was kind of you know a part of the relationship building at the time between <laughs> nations and um certainly chalked on french nations as well and so um while this isn't necessarily from um <clears throat> Choctaw homelands, it still kind of represents, again, the story of that, um, you know, nation to nation relationship and building um, during the time period. So, um, and if you have questions about any particular items, um, certainly in the Q&A at the end, um, we'll be able to talk about um, some of these items more in depth. So we are moving forward. Uh, in this room presents, as I was telling you, uh, a number of items from all over the world. And in the next uh, slide, you can have a, a look of, um, at other types of objects. Uh, so uh, the central window case shows these objects from uh, the Guyanas uh, in the north part of South America. And um, in the back, you can see objects from Asia. Uh, the next slide, please. You can also see here objects from North America, either books that are held today in the libraries uh, that uh, are travel accounts from people traveling at that time in the Americas, and also a pipe tomahawk that uh, is also um, reflects also the uh, relations between Native Americans and French. 
the pipe uh, tomahawk was done by French people and was a very prestigious item that uh, was offered to their Native American partners. So in the following uh, slides, you can have a closer look to the book and how at this time the interest from North America was very uh, important and you had a lot of representation showing uh, the um, partners of the French uh, in North America. So here is a, a famous book from Gracie de Saint Sauveur that published a book with all the costumes of peoples from all over the world. And in the next slide, you can have a closer look to the pipe tomahawk. So it is uh, a specimen that still bears its state of fabrication. It was done in 1763. In the next slide, you can see other items uh, extremely old and you see how old are the labels. Unfortunately, sometimes you cannot read them as it is the case in this one, but uh, these um, figurines uh, probably arrived to France in the 17th century. So they're all really um, amongst the first uh, type of figurines that arrived in, in France. So this is really uh, the, um, the importance of this collection from Pont d'Artois. You have objects from all over the world in particular from uh, Northern America that arrived uh, during the period of Ancien Regime in the 17th and the 18th century. So in the following room, um, we speak about what happens during the revolution. The revolution was, uh, as you know, <laughs> well, it, it changed everything in France. And um, with the abol abolition of the monarchy, uh, there are going to be a lot of destructions made by, by French people who wanted to uh, destroy all the um, pieces of art, all the things that remembered monarchy and the despotism. So very quickly, the new government is going to have to reflect on how to protect uh, this uh, art. And there was really something that was very contradictory because everybody was agreed in the fact that they didn't want to have symbols of the monarchy of dep or despotism. Um, uh, in, in, in France, but at the same time, all the art and the artistic production was linked to the story of the monarchy and the church. So at some point, um, the rules were set, new laws that were meant to uh, seize all the collections from the family, from the, uh, the royal family, from the crown. So the collection of Condatois was seized and you also had the uh, uh, religious congregations collections that were seized and also the collections from the aristocrats that had uh, um, gone away from France. And those collections were uh, sorted out. Um, there were commissioners that decided what were the pieces of uh, art that had to be um, kept for the instruction of French people. And those were uh, taken to the new museums that were created at that time. So um, the collection of Comte d'Artois was transferred um, eventually to the Chateau de Versailles that had become a big museum. It was not longer the house of the royal family, but it became uh, a big uh, museum, uh, like the Musée du Louvre also, that uh, was created at that time uh, in Paris, and the collection of Grand Artois was taken there. It was completed with other uh, seizures uh, from other collections, and in 1803, the collection was taken and transferred to the library, where it is stayed uh, over um, uh, more than a century. So at that time, the North American collection was even bigger. For example, we had uh, 20 heights and not uh, so two more uh, that were added to the collections. In the next slide, you can see um, so the portrait of Ricans, uh, which is at the center of this gallery. We, we, you cannot. Uh, forget the story of the French First Empire when you are here in this room. You have paintings that show you all the time uh, how the, the ambitions of the crown of France uh, over, over Europe and the rest of the world. In the next slide, um, we have another view of these uh, third rooms. Um, in the following slide, we have a closer look to some uh, of the objects presented here, and in particular, you can see on your right uh, an African mask that was uh, for a long time called uh, um, hunting mask from Louisiana. It is the way this mask was uh, named in the inventory of the collection when it arrives in 1806 to the library uh, of Versailles, and um, it was later uh, 
understood that it was an African mask. And for a long time too, uh, the story of that mask was that uh, it had been taken from a African slave to the Americas, to Louisiana, and it had then uh, come back to, come to, to France. Uh, today, we think that this mask never went to uh, Louisiana, but you see how uh, the story of these old collections are always <laughs> very intricate, and, and you really have uh, to be very careful with the sources and combine archival research with um, observation and study of uh, material culture to try to better understand the objects you have here. You usually, very often, you have uh, objects that are unique in the world. So how, how do you do to study a piece that is unique? You, you cannot really compare it to other things. So it is really uh, a very um, complicated research and that is why we try to have a combined look uh, over these uh, old and very precious uh, items. In the following slide, you, you, you can see uh, pictures of the collections that the drawings that were done at the beginning of the uh, 19th century for a publication that was never done. We don't really un, uh, know exactly when these drawings were done, but you see uh, representations of this uh, important collection of hides that today is held uh, in Paris and in other cities in France. In the next uh, slide, uh, you can see other things that we show here in the um, exhibition, all these archives, and in the following <laughs> slide, uh, all the inventories that we use to track the objects and understand the story. And now we arrive to um, the uh, fourth room, where we present how the collection uh, was held here in the library in the 19th century. In, in the next slide, you can have a look on um, the photographies of the cabinets in the beginning of the 20th century. We have these incredible um, photos that show us all the collection. It was held in the fourth floor of the library and you can recognize uh, everything. You see how uh, also objects uh, evolve in time as their conservation, some uh, state of conservation sometimes um, change. In the following slide, you see other objects that arrive at that time, so no longer from the Americas, much less the objects that arrive at are mainly arriving from Oceania, Africa and Asia, where the French people had their colonies at that time. So here you have, for example, objects from Hawaii. And in, uh, you can go further. So uh, in 1933, the collection will be moved and transferred to the Museum of Ethnography in Paris, who was at that time trying to, um, uh, was renovating itself. And uh, that is the reason why today the Musée du Quai who is a, a heir, a descendant of that museum, I don't know how we have the collections from that institution. So that explains why the collections are from the library are today held at the Musée du Quai and now we arrive at the last, uh, the last room, which is the chapter room. So I leave you, um, Jennifer, the presentation of that uh, uh, room. Yeah. Thank you, Paz. And um, so obviously this, um, this project is, is part of a, a broader um, kind of project, as, as Paz mentioned, uh, about um, kind of collaborating with um, different um, nations to better understand um, the Native or the North American collections from from this this um, royal collection that um, Paz was kind of showing that that is presented in in this exhibit, and to um, work through this exhibit, we um, selected a number of items that were related to um, the southeast, and those were kind of selected by either kind of um, you know some some sources that we we. Um, had already kind of been familiar with and, and connecting it with pieces in the collection or um, pieces in the collection that are quite similar or kind of connected either like the same species, you know, material wise that we would use or um, items that were traded through um, Choctaw um, homelands um, in the 1700s and and during this time period. So um, you see some, some familiar faces in the banners. So we have um, kind of, uh, a view of side by side um, 
both the, the kind of French museum uh, depiction of, of what kind of the Indian was um, in, in their minds, and then, you know, sort of who, um, who we are today as Choctaw Nation. And so, um, you know, we have these, um, <clears throat> oops, I'm trying to go um, forward a bit, but um, we have uh, accounts of <clears throat> the, the Choctaw French relationship from this time period, which began in um, the year 1700 and <clears throat> really throughout um, this, this time period in this century, Choctaws and French were, were strong allies. It, it certainly wasn't a, a perfect relationship and there were um, different kind of um, really strong political actors creating, you know, making different decisions um, during this time period, but you had um, intermarriages and, um, you have an exchange of, of food and trade items of um, of names and um, and so you know we have many actually uh, names in 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 Choctaw um, family names that have um, you know French connections um, and so there are things that we think of as as Choctaw today and, and certainly they are but they also have a, a connection back to this um, shared exchange and and history. Um, from this time period. So, um, just to look at some of the items that we pulled out for, um, from the collections for the exhibit, um, here we have a trade cloth, uh, legging on the left with beadwork. And of course the diamonds, um, that we see are something that we really, um, recognize and are drawn to. And you'll also notice that throughout the exhibit, um, the, um, exhibit designer used, um, the diamond, uh, motif to kind of tie together all the parts of the exhibit, um, talking about this collection. Um, and so a lot of these items, you know, they, as Paz mentioned earlier, they have sort of a complicated history as to um, kind of the origin and, and all of the different steps that they took to arrive in this collection. So sometimes we have some of that information and often we may not. Um, and so we kind of drew from the collection knowing the connections that we do um, and the kind of the picture of Choctaw life ways um, in the 1700s. Um, so, we also tie together these different items with current artists that are working with these techniques. And in consultation, we were able to kind of um, share with the museum and go back and forth on um, kind of, here's how, um, you know, different artists would make this. So um, Dr. Ian Thompson shared um, kind of his experience with working with these materials, but we also were able to show some of these items to, um, some Choctaw community members and artists, and they could comment on, um, you know, what they did recognize from these items uh, technique wise. And so here you have, um, you know, Brad Joe um, working on moccasins next to a pair of bear paw moccasins, um, which we'll show a little bit better in, in a minute, um, as well as a shell pictorial um, along with um, Michael, Michael Rose working on um, shell shell work. Um, and then we also have um, a, a bison hair oblique interlaced beaded sash here with trade beads. Um, this particularly was uh, a wonderful thing to see uh, as kind of part of the Choctaw textile workshop group. We created a, a bison hair skirt for the cultural center. So this really tied in um, kind of at, at the same time as we're working on some of these same, um, you know, revitalization projects and, um, you know, being able to look at this and see kind of the different choices that, um, you know, this, this person made, um, you know, one of the Choctaw ancestors made while they were um, making this item. So, um, or, or one of our kind of, you know, Southeastern or, um, you know, wherever that artist was from, but certainly tied to the material traditions of, um, of uh, Choctaw people as well. Um, so one of the pieces that uh, might be a bit surprising is the headdress. Obviously, um, you know, um, often we don't talk about, um, you know, certain types of headdresses um, for Choctaw heritage because um, they're coming from other regions. But this headdress um, in particular, um, we, um, 
have an image of, of Choctaw people uh, from the 1700s that you see off to your um, right there, and it's from 1732. It's an Alexander de Bat's watercolor. So it's a French um, artist who did this watercolor of Choctaw uh, people, and off to the right, there's a man, um, a, you know, presumably a chief, but he's wearing a headdress. And if you look closely at the drawing, it's quite similar to this headdress. So um, there are accounts about um, Choctaws wearing headdresses, but it's not something we commonly talk about today. So to be able to kind of um, go back to this and look at this item in new in a new light was a really kind of powerful experience. Les Williston also created um, a, a headdress kind of based off of a picture of this headdress uh, a couple of years ago for the the cultural center and you can see that on display. So there's a lot of kind of, it's, it's sort of a conversation with um, the artists who made these items and kind of with, um, you know, across time and space, this kind of conversation. Um, and then we have a garfish um, skin quiver off to the side and uh, there's also some, some darts made out of um, cane um, with, uh, you know, you have your kind of thistle um, at the top. And uh, here you have the headdress side by side, um, the one from the cultural center on the right and the one from the Musée du Quai Branly um, on the left. And so um, the, uh, the, the watercolor, you can kind of even see, you know, this, this, um, this band of the quill work um, and uh, less included these kind of um, tabs at the top at, in his piece. Um, so here's another view of these items. Again, we can come back and, and um, kind of talk about this more in the Q&A. So I want to leave time for that. Um, and we also have a drawing of um, Choctaw clothing um, from the time period. Um, and here's an image um, from the opening. We also um, have a scroll pattern on, on the um, exhibit banners and um, kind of some quotes from um, Choctaw um, people. Uh, it's actually from a, a French account, um, an anonymous 18th century French account um, that's on this, um, some of the banners in the room. And I'd like to just kind of read this off as sort of a framing of the Choctaw French relationship. Um, so formerly our ancestors occupied the place you now live and came there to hunt. They have ceded it to you as to people who wish to be their friends in consideration for which you have promised them a certain quantity of goods and length of time has not canceled the continuance of the gift and of the friendship, which having reigned between our ancestors and the French reigns still between you and us. So this was um, a recorded Choctaw speech to French allies in the 18th century. Um, and so this is kind of, again, this um, project is a reflection of this kind of older relationship. So while it's a, an exhibit years in the making, you could think of it kind of as a relationship that's been actually hundreds of years um, in, in the making. Um, so here again, there's the bear palm moccasins, um, a trade bead necklace and a shell um, bead brace, you know, or shell beads and uh, a shell pectoral. So another view of these, more of the shell. So this would be the same um, species that would be found and passed through Choctaw homeland. Um, and we also created a bit of film to show an exhibit um, which in which um, different um, Choctaw community members um, kind of could see the items and talk about um, the history uh, from this time period and the Choctaw French relationships. Um, that were from that time period. Um, and we also uh, produced a, a children's brochure with or kind of um, worked with the uh, Versailles Library to do that. And so they um, translated uh, the possum story for us, um, which was really wonderful. So Terry Billy from the language department shared the story with us and um, they translated it into French, which is really a delight to read. Um, and then we also shared a, a Wallachshi um, Choctaw recipe in the book as well. So just wanted to highlight, um, there have been a lot of people that have been a part of this um, project and who have contributed to the project along the way. 
Um, so we're, we're so thankful to all of the, the Choctaw contributors and the French teams um, and who worked tirelessly to kind of make this um, project possible. So we'll go ahead and kind of um, break out for a Q&A now and um, go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and we've been joined by two more. <laughs> um, so we have uh, Leandro and uh, Barisan and Nicolas Stola who have um, been able to join us. Um, so uh, if anybody has, um, you know, I think we do have some questions now. And so we'll go ahead and um, move into that. Um, so it looks like um, we're still going to wait on a couple more questions to come in, um, but for now we can kind of break into some of the other areas we didn't get to touch on um, as much in this um, presentation. So um, one of the things that um, we wanted to talk about is the, the fact that um, these are items related to the Choctaw story, but not necessarily um, Choctaw items. So kind of a picture of a broader um, landscape of the Southeast in the time period. Um, and I should mention that we did provide, uh, we, we uh, worked on creating a map um, in, in, and it uses kind of um, French terms and that was a little bit to figure out of uh, a map of Choctaw history to um, present sort of the landscape of um, Louisiana and um, the Choctaw view of this landscape and where we've kind of um, our homelands have been over time. But our, our French partners also um, shared with us some maps and some some archives that they found um, in their work for this. And so we're kind of looking at, again, this is a broader landscape of, of the time period and our Choctaw kind of presentation and perspective on um, this landscape. So um, one of, okay, we do have a question um, from uh, Brent Doremus, who's actually a a Choctaw artist, and he has a couple of questions. I'm actually wearing some of your earrings, Brent, <laughs> today. Um, and he says, I have a couple of questions about the headdress. Um, is the crown wood or hide? And what species of bird feather was used? So um, I might leave that to um, someone from the Musée du Quai Branly, because I know they've been doing some conservation work on these items as well. And so I don't know if um, <laughs> one of you could, would like to uh, talk about um, the, the species of uh, bird feather that was um, used on this. And you're still muted, so. Um, if you could just speak up a little bit more, um, we don't quite hear you. Hopefully it works. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to work in cooperation with you and Jennifer, many thanks for you. I think we might have just lost your audio. It was good for a second, um, but it, it might just be me. So anyone else? Okay, I will change. I will change the screen. Okay, there you are. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to have some technical difficulties along the way. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, it's a bit problematic. Um, the material has not been confirmed so far, um, but most probably the feathers are made out of raven or crow, uh, including some eagle feathers in front. These three feathers are eagle feathers. And the entire headdress is made out of um, brain tanned deer hide. So it's it's dark. It uh, has been dyed uh, maybe by walnuts or whatever. So it's a dark cap. And on top are soon uh, feathers assembled in clusters made out of uh, raven or crow. And on top we have two layers of uh, crow or um, raven feathers. It's an extraordinary piece. In fact, it's the only one in existence known to me. There's only one which is quite similar um, preserved at Sweden. 
Thank you, Nikolaus. Um, I don't know if Ian, if you want to talk more broadly about kind of how this fits into Choctaw arts and, and the different techniques and materials that were involved or kind of would have been made uh, used to make this item. Absolutely. <clears throat> You know, it, it was a, an honor to, to get to work on this project. Let me start by saying that. Really appreciate our, our partnership with the institutions in France and the, the Bromley. Uh, it was awesome to get to look at these pieces as, you know, someone that's done Choctaw traditional arts for most of my life. It was amazing to get to see videos of them and to work with the staff there to learn more about them. Um, in terms of the construction, you know, it, it's a little bit, if you kind of think of a Choctaw stickball cap, it's a little bit of a forerunner of that stick ball caps that were made in the early 1900s. Uh, if you trace that back, some of them were made from brain tan, like Nicholas was saying. Um, one of the interesting things about it, of course, is the porcupine quill work. If, if this was Choctaw, and it, again, there is an image of a Choctaw chief from 1732 that appears to be wearing almost the same feather bonnet. But if it was Choctaw, it's interesting to think about where the porcupine quills came from. You know, the porcupine's not native to the Choctaw homeland. There are French accounts from the early 1700s that talk about quill work being done in the present state of Mississippi. You know, we can only assume that, it, you know, maybe the quills or the porcupine hides were, were shipped down the Mississippi River as a trade item from tribes up farther north. Um, you know, there's a lot that we don't know about this piece. Color symbolism is important. You know, black symbolism, feathers were often used in connection with death, you know, there were symbolism for that. And probably this feather bonnet was connected with a warrior. So it's it's not hard to think that maybe those feathers were connected with deeds that he'd done in defense of his community on the battlefield, possibly. Thank you, Ian. Um, certainly that's one of those items that I think, um, you know, there's a reason that it was on the uh, the banner. It's, it's a really incredible piece. And I think it tells um, a pretty amazing story. Um, so if anybody else has questions about that, you can also, you know, continue to, you know, ask more about that. But um, I also wanted to um, talk about the film a little bit more. And um, that's in the last room in the, in the Choctaw room. And um, Megan uh, worked really tirelessly to bring that together. And, um, and Mark Williams was, um, uh, he worked with Historic Preservation to work on that as well. So, um, Megan, can you talk about um, the process and kind of who all was involved and um, some of the things that came out of that? Yeah, sure. And I just want to say thank you to everyone so much for this amazing partnership. It was incredible. I've never done a museum project before, and it was like the best ever one um, hard to top. <laughs> Um, so, for the exhibit video, um, I was really wanting to bring in actual kind of Choctaw people as a living, breathing um, kind of community. And so, we kind of figured that would be a great way to kind of bring them into that space that's so kind of prestigious and um, well known. And so, it's really great to have our community members kind of on the walls and moving around in the exhibit itself. Since we, most of, most of them can't go them there, can't go to France themselves. Um, so we worked with Mark Williams, who is a Choctaw Seminole um, filmmaker, and we have worked with him before. Um, and so we did two days of interviews with community members um, who kind of knew about French Choctaw history. Um, I think we did about 11 interviews um, with different people, um, including Tony Billy, Les Williston, and Evelyn Steele. Um, so Les and Evelyn are um, Choctaw artists, and so they know a lot about um, the creations of kind of items. Um, and so we wanted to kind of get their first reactions to looking at the pieces. And so that was like one of the best kind of parts of the filming, because um, you could see their kind of immediate reaction. And so um, that video is also on the Choctaw Nation Cultural Center's um, exhibit page, and so you can also watch that there. Um, but yeah, so it really captures them like seeing the items for the first time. And so what we have in the exhibit video is less seeing the bear paw moccasins for the first time and he kind of like nerds out. It's a really great um, moment. And so we just have those along with a little bit about the history of the relationship, which Ian, um, Ryan, and Tody really talked about kind of extensively. Um, and we ended up having like 11 hours of footage that we had to cut down to five 
uh, minutes to go on the exhibit, so that was pretty tough. Um, but it was pretty um, great, and so now we're definitely going to use that footage for different kinds of blog posts because that was also part of the project is that we have a blog. So we'll be cutting those into um, shorter videos for people to kind of learn a bit more from those people who shared so much of their knowledge. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, that that moment where Les Wilson is reacting to the pieces is very cool. It, it made it into the video because it was like, yeah, it was it was a perfect kind of, um, you know, capturing of you know just how exciting it is to see these items and and also my favorite part of this project. Um, we do have another question about the experience of working on the exhibit throughout COVID, and it was also at a distance. Um, and certainly, I think everyone can uh, could chime in on this one. We had a consultation back in December, um, and it was actually, in a way, it's, it's really wonderful because, um, uh, like Megan was saying, we were able to kind of uh, get more creative about how we were sharing uh, pieces and sharing this project with different community members. So even just holding up pictures during an interview and kind of capturing this moment of um, kind of uh, looking at this history um, was really wonderful. But of course, we were doing everything on Zoom, which was, you know, we would have liked to be in person and kind of you know, uh, being able to look at these items more closely, um, but we still kind of have uh, hope that we have um, certainly more to do in this project. And, um, uh, you know, we have, you know, there are plans in the works and kind of conversations about making this um, exhibit available in the cultural center in future years. So um, those are two different topics though. So I want to kind of maybe um, pull on, uh, kind of point to paths to first talk about, you know, the um, kind of what it was like to, to coordinate all of this during COVID because she also been coordinating other partnerships along the way, and I believe they have a delegation coming um, soon. And so there's kind of so many different pieces to this. And certainly anybody else can chime in on this. Um, and then we'll come back to the kind of the cultural center item. <laughs> I like the, the musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yes, working with COVID was really um, a surprise for everyone, I think, but uh, I, I don't know, we, we are so happy of the experience that uh, it led to, because uh, we realized that in the end we can really work very well at distance, and I think it's uh, very um, empowering us to, to go um, more into contact with communities and um, yeah, I think it was very hard, but we were, it was such a nice surprise to, to realize that uh, we could do great things um, at a distance. I, I still cannot believe we have done this uh, exhibition uh, together where I feel you have been present at every step of the production. Uh, of course, we were lucky because we had a scenographer that had uh, modelized all the rooms, so he did presentations of what uh, how things were going to be installed, how the labels were going to be done, that uh, was uh, that allow us to share a lot of the space. I think you, you could follow more or less the project, even if you were not here. Um, but then uh, we were so lucky to work with you because you are really a very organized team and you are so complementary. And, uh, you know, we don't have an archaeologist in our team and you had an archaeologist in your team. and. And uh, I don't know, we were so complimentary and uh, you, Jennifer, work on the textiles. Uh, we don't have a specialist working on textiles here. So I don't know. I think um, there is something about destiny, too, in this project. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we feel very lucky. So um, yeah, a, a great pleasure. And I must say it was my only pleasure during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't think I, I would like to, uh, Leandro to add something because Leandro uh, has done a lot. He he has arrived to the museum. Uh, I don't know when. It seems like a lifetime, but I think he only arrived three years ago, and uh, um, he had much more experience on working with uh, um, communities at a distance. So he has been really an input to all uh, the will we had to do those things. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Pat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been working with uh, Indigenous nations in communities for um, so many years, but uh, it was really a pleasure to work with all of you because you're so organized, so professional, and so complementary to our work. And it's really nice to see uh, these objects coming back to reconnection, um, to make connections, because the uh, other relationships that were, were embodied in these objects were lost. And now to being able to reconnect with the Choctaw Nation and to be rebuilding relationships based on these objects, even if it, it's on the online for now, uh, but it's really a pleasure to see this kind of uh, project uh, contributing to rebuild relations from nation to nation. It's a, it was really a pleasure working with you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I can only I can only add it was it was incredible to talk to you to e, to even to, to get information about the uh, collection about the objects it was an honor and I learned a lot and uh, I want to do it if the, there would be an option I want to do it again it's amazing it was really great thank you so much yeah and I think if I only have to add something is that we are really looking forward to your visits we have been looking forward to the visits for a long time so. <laughs> Okay. I hope uh, we will have you here in the near future. Well, that is a really beautiful answer, I think, to um, what was the impact of COVID on, on this project, because it really, I think, can show that in a lot of ways, obviously, it was a difficult time. I think there are, you know, um, quarantines, there were different things that happened, but it really didn't, um, I think, uh, it didn't stop us and it, and it kind of, in a way, it uh, pushed us um, kind of it was this, this challenge to kind of uh, work together more. And, and it was really, a, um, as everyone has said, um, a really uh, just kind of wonderful experience, very promising, I think, for um, future collaborations and just, um, I think, a, a, an excellent model for kind of how much you can accomplish, even if you're at a distance. So obviously we couldn't. Um, you know, we couldn't travel, but um, I think we, we accomplished so much and we weren't kind of relying on one visit, but this kind of continuous back and forth exchange, which was um, extremely rich um, and, and sort of along those lines. And I think, you know, we touched on this earlier, um, uh, but what opportunities do we see to continue um, our relationship for future generations of Choctaw and French people. And I think you can see, um, so that's that's one of the questions in the Q&A. And I think you can see, obviously, this, this relationship has gone, you know, it, it's been um, hundreds of years in the making. Um, and and here we are in, in kind of 2021. And, and I think that we still have um, a lot that we could, we can do. Um, and so I don't know if, um, has you want to um, comment on and some of the kind of future projects you're working on both like um, kind of with the broader collection and this and then also I'd like to hear from Katie as well with the cultural center and um, some of the kind of ways that we want to work this in there as well. So, um, yeah, yes, go I ahead. Pat, yeah. Yes, we, uh, I was saying at the beginning of um, the events that uh, we have this big research project on the royal collections, and indeed we have uh, the next uh, project. The other project we are building now is an exhibition on Wampum, and we are working with the Haudenosaunee Nation and the huron wendat Nations. And um, the Haudenosaunee Nation is coming. Um, on, they are arriving uh, in October 11. So one of the first visits they will do on their first day <laughs> here in Paris is coming to Versailles to see this exhibit. So, so um, well, we want to really share this experience uh, with them. But I really think that the next step for us is uh, thinking about uh, making the objects, the Choctaw objects and the objects from uh, the Southeast uh, travel to Oklahoma. This is uh, our priority. So um, I think we, we, well, as soon as we are uh, now that we have opened this exhibition, we can start thinking about the next step. And Katie, if you yeah, want to jump just in. To, 
absolutely. Just to you know, tag on to what Paz said, you know, we the Choctaw Cultural Center opened July 23rd, and it's over 100,000 square feet of ex exhibition, um, demonstration, restaurant, retail, theater. So we have some really beautiful space, and part of that is a changing exhibit gallery. And it is, you know, our hope that you know, we can work out, uh, you know, a, a loan agreement so that we can do an exhibit based on these items and then Choctaw community members can come see them in person. I think, you know, we've, in these consultations, we've taken a lot of influence from these as, you know, Les Williston used the headdress to model a new one that is on exhibit in the Choctaw Cultural Center. So I think that being able to bring these items to the Choctaw Nation and letting community members see it, I think that will be an incredible experience. Yeah, I, I think that we can definitely look forward to that day and um, obviously that will take a lot more work and continued collaboration and and um, they really just to kind of share this at the museum kind of built this into the exhibit. So creating um, kind of uh, cases, if I'm correct, that that could travel across basically, you know, just a short distance for this exhibit so that in the future they can travel much further. <laughs> so they really. Um, built this in along the way as kind of, this is a, just a first step towards sharing this with um, the Choctaw community and in Oklahoma, which um, I, I just um, think it's, it's really impressive because I think it just shows um, how much kind of um, care and thought has gone into um, this project along the way. Um, and just uh, what uh, kind of a joy it's been, uh, just almost kind of so easy, even though a lot of work um, to work together on this. Um, and and one thing I would just kind of add to the future of of the project and the relationship is um, that that there's still more research to be done. There's still a lot more to learn. So of course we can only do so much. Um, in, in some ways with uh, COVID and everything, we couldn't, um, I know they had, uh, Nicolas had to kind of had restricted hours. You could get into the archives. So you could only do um, so much because originally the exhibit was going to be in April and then May. And so we were kind of doing everything in quite a short sort of almost six or eight months timeline. And then, and then it was pushed back, but um, you know, they helped us kind of get access to some some maps that we had wanted to get access to and different things, but we're still um, we started this research in 2016 um, and and it's something that's still, you know, still continuing. So there's still quite a lot to, to learn more about um, and and other kind of aspects of this exchange we can do research into. So um, it's certainly kind of not not where it's ended. Um, um, I guess one one question I'd like uh, Ian to answer, and I think you know we haven't talked a lot about all the particulars of the different items. So um, you know, like the shell work, and there's some other things that um, you know we could really comment more in depth. But just the potential or kind of the future of more you know revitalization projects, or what else we can still continue to learn, um, and the relationships that we can have with um, these items and this. Um, these kinds of collections, and if you could just kind of comment on um, what more that we kind of want to continue to kind of learn and do with this. Absolutely. So the these objects that the Bronley has uh, allowed us to interact with, you know, these are our ancestors speaking to us, and it's a lot more than just physical objects. You know, our ancestors had a very special interaction with the homeland. They had a, a cultural way of living. And because of colonization, those things have been not put to sleep, but they're not as prominent as they used to be, some aspects of that. So by getting to interact with these pieces, even if it's digitally, we're getting to learn from our ancestors. And that's important, again, more than just aspects of art. It's important for who we are as Choctaw people. And getting to see these objects and connect them with the community, um, you know, there was there's so many different opportunities and it, it's exciting that they're going to be coming possibly to Oklahoma. Um, Choctaw Nation has active projects to revitalize some of these very traditional arts. We do brain tanning classes. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, there's the Choctaw textile group. There are Choctaw artists that do traditional shell work, even with stone tools, just like the old pieces that were there. 
Um, we've been working extensively to revitalize Choctaw moccasins. So all of this information feeds into those activities that Choctaw Nation is already doing to revitalize some of these core aspects of our indigenous culture. And again, our, our culture, to me, it's something that, that's timeless. It's not just set in the past. You know, it's useful to learn about the past because of colonization, you know, that sort of that's sort of in the space between now and back then when our ancestors had full sovereignty in their homeland. So getting to interact with these pieces, it's an opportunity to take that forward into the future and it's exciting where that may go. Thank you, Ian. Um, just while we're kind of on this topic, is there um, are there any items? <laughs> I know that originally we were, we were kind of going to do um, a, a video kind of of the exhibit and show that, and that's still coming. Um, and we we also have another uh, kind of video coming very soon, a teaser video of the exhibit. So so there's some other ways to see um, some of the items on exhibit. Um, uh, in the future, we have also some object videos that the museum did for us. But if anybody has, um, you know, kind of a, a specific item, even Ian, if you want to, you know, point to a specific item that you would like to talk about more, or, you know, uh, certainly, you know, uh, I don't know if we want to kind of make them get up and take a, a webcam over, but, um, you know, uh, we can. <laughs> Don't want to throw off the the technology, but Ian, is there any kind of particular item that was your favorite, or you'd like to kind of touch on more? Well, these items are really special because of their age. You know, it's things from the 1800s for us are rare. Things from the early 1800s are even rare. And you know, a lot of these objects are from the French period. So you know, we're talking 1760s and before. So it's exciting to see that because it's the roots of our current traditional culture. Um, for me, I, I love doing traditional hide tanning. I love tanning bison hides. I'm in the process of tanning one right now, actually. So it's neat to see the, the hide work that comes from, you know, we don't know that it, it's Choctaw. I think one of the pieces is Mark Quapa, which is a, a neighboring tribe for us. But it's neat to see these hides from the, the southeast and the intricacy of the designs, it's neat to see the way that their skin, skinning itself is an art form. So, you know, for me, I think that was probably the most interesting part, getting to see the, the mind of the ancestors in these hides. But, but every piece is so important and so special. Oh, man, excellent. This is the, yes. this is the we are, we're waiting for. <laughs> Right. So we're seeing seeing the um, the really excellent. I love webcam quality. This is great. I this is we're getting the live kind of view if we're leaning up to the glass in the exhibit as you would really push your nose to the glass. <laughs> so there's the garfish um, gar skin fish quiver um, and. Ian, um, the darts that um, that are there with the quiver, um, you described how those were made. Can you quickly kind of um, share that? Absolutely. Um, Some of those are made from, it appears, splints of river cane. Or the river cane's a, a hollow native bamboo, and you can split that into strips and then sharpen one end, fire harden it. Some of those have been twisted. To do that, you get um, you get the river cane strips and you coat them in grease and you hold it over the coals of the fire and it gets pliable, kind of like wood does when you do that. And then you can hold one into your teeth and then twist it and it puts that spiral shape in there. The back end is fletchings made from thistle down, it appears. Uh, that's put on there with a strip of sinew, animal tendon, and then that seals the breech of the blowgun. Uh, we still make and use those in our community. I, I've killed squirrels with darts almost exactly like that before. And the quiver is really interesting too, because that's a technology that you don't see from the southeast. Um, you know, it's hide work for from a, a garfish. It, it's beautiful. You know, you just that artisan captured the the essence of that animal in that. And of course, garfish have sharp teeth. They're pretty ferocious fish, so that connects with a, a quiver for holding blowgun darts that are used, you know, to pierce animals uh, for hunting. So. It's, I mean, like, like all of them, it's a special piece. Thank you, Ian, and um, thank you, Leandro, for, for this really wonderful 
webcam tour. This is great. So there are the bear paw moccasins um, and there's the shell pectoral. Um, Say that the, the shell pectoral and the beadwork there, those are special because usually they were of enough significance that our ancestors who owned those, when they passed away, they were buried with them. So, you know, because of respect for our ancestors, we don't study those. We don't study anything that came from a burial. But these pieces here were gifts to the French. So that they, they've never been in a burial. So it's really neat to see these and interact with them digitally. And then um, the, the bear paw moccasins, um, those are uh, listed or kind of described as being from Louisiana. And, and there are some accounts of Choctaws and Chickasaws um, using the feet of bears and tying them to their feet to outtrack the enemy. Now, these aren't necessarily going to leave that bear print um, when you wear them. Um, but uh, I think when we looked at this, Ian, if it's if it's correct, and, and Nicolas, I know you looked um, kind of at the con construction as well, but it's it's the entire kind of barefoot. And then I think there's a sewn on kind of deer, maybe hide patch on the on the back. Ranty and tied, if that's correct. Yeah, there, there's a, a piece of hide on the bottom. It's not the, the pads of the animal's feet, like you were talking about the old accounts where they use those to, to make false footprints to confuse people. So we're we're not we're not real positive uh, about how these may have been used because they don't have that. It could have been in ceremony. It could have belonged to another tribe. But there are connections with the Choctaw and Chickasaw people did, to be sure. Um, and of course, the textiles are are really wonderful. Certainly, a lot of people um, do beadwork, uh, of course, and so. Um, the leggings really um, a great piece um, and and quite, you know, again, it has the diamonds that could kind of come from uh, a, a different region, but it certainly has a lot of connections with how um, uh, Choctaws do beadwork um, today and, and throughout um, the past few hundred years. And um, the bison hair sash is just really lovely. <laughs> Um, and I uh, really look forward to seeing it in person and looking at how they were spinning the uh, yarn. You can kind of see where a few warps have broken. And so you can kind of study exactly how um, they strung the beads on um, the, the warps and, and how that all came together. Um, did certainly a lot did you work. talk about that process real briefly, Jennifer? The, yeah. the drop spins? Yeah. And so, so the bison hair, um, bison hair is. Today, most modern spinners don't really think that you can kind of um, uh, spin bison hair by itself, but um, we <laughs> we did in a, in our um, workshop group, and and um, you have to kind of get the the bison hair down, and um, we pulled the wool off of the hide when it had been soaked in wood ash, but um, and water, but you can also cut it from the hide, but the hair is extremely short, um, and so. You have to kind of um, spin it quite tight with a, a drop spindle um, in order to get um, the, the yarn to hold together. And um, it's a ton of work just to get it spun. Um, we have a couple of the spinners from that project on the call um, today. And um, it was the bulk of the, the work was um, doing that part, but then um, it's done in an oblique interlace. So it's basically plain weave, but on a diagonal and woven and, and the, the trade beads are strung onto warp strands. So that's actually quite a lot of beads <laughs> for, for a project. So it's gonna take a lot of time just to get um, those beads that are pretty much exactly the same size as the warp strung on there and not to kind of, um, have any warping in the in the fabric. So a really lovely piece. So um, Brent was commenting on the, the quiver as well. I mean it's definitely a really a unique piece as far as what we have in collections today to look at. Um, and here we have our, our banners um, and we have a map of uh, Louisiana there that we hadn't seen before and so um, the museum shared this with us and, and they found it in archival research so 
um, you know, we were able to kind of get access to that over time. And you're also seeing the picture that's behind me that's actually in the exhibit um, at, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but if you kind of go back and look um, at the recording later on, this um, image of the Choctaw homelands is behind the doors. Um, and so you actually see this going through the hallway through the entire exhibit. And so it sort of sets the stage of kind of the landscape of um, the collections and where things are coming from um, back into um, the homelands um, and, and back into North America. So um, this was actually um, kind of uh, really, uh, again, a collaboration. And we also have the Choctaw Seal up at the top, but um, it's a really beautiful way to kind of set these items at home. Um, in a way, um, and we also have a, a panel that um, is on sort of the future of um, Choctaw Nation. It includes a picture of the the Indigenous Immersion Camp that we do um, every year, as well as um, a story about a French person at, at Bottle Creek and just some of the difficult parts of. Uh, collecting and um, we didn't talk about that in the presentation earlier as much. Um, but, um, you know, there are some some difficult sides of these collections, certainly items that, you know, ended up in collections that, um, you know, our ancestors, um, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily always the, the relationship wasn't a perfect one. And so um, some of the difficulties and the ways that we're working to kind of write those um, uh, those stories. And um, I don't know if Ian, if you want to kind of elaborate on that, but um, you know, the, the fact that um, Choctaw Nation and many other tribes are continually to work, continuing to work on sort of relationship building, but as well as um, kind of repatriation um, for certain uh, collections. You know, the, the Choctaw community, we're, we're a community that, that's faced colonization. And, you know, today we're working to rebuild some of the damage that's been done. Um, you know, there were systematic efforts to, to dig up Choctaw cemeteries, um, to study Choctaw human remains and funerary objects. With the passage of the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act in the United States that allows, under some circumstances, for tribes to reclaim our ancestors' remains and respectfully rebury them. So we have, the Choctaw Nation, we have proactive programs that, and you know, we've got the No Stone Unturned program that's contacting every single federal repository in the United States to see if they have Choctaw human remains. And then we work with them to get those returned so we can respectfully rebury them. There's also intellectual aspects of repatriation. You know, like I was talking about earlier, the knowledge that's built into traditional arts. Um, so we have programs that we've worked on for, for years. Jennifer has worked on these programs to proactively contact collections all over the world that may have Choctaw pieces of traditional art in them and build relationships with those institutions so that, you know, we may be able to provide something useful to them, knowledge about those pieces, but then they can provide information about those to the Choctaw community. And that's part of where our current relationship with the Brown Lee came about. It was through those contacts. So through this, this joint partnership, you know, in, in a small way, I think we're working through one of those aspects of colonization in a way that benefits the descendants of the French and the Choctaw today, 300 years later. Thank you, Ian. And I think that really brings us full circle to back when we started to talk about <clears throat> um, that email exchange between Paz and I, and, and she was the one that kind of suggested, well, why don't we, you know, maybe someday have an exhibit where Choctaw Nation kind of um, can kind of give this perspective and talk about these pieces. And so here we are today with um, this exhibit. And um, I think that really covers a lot of what we want to talk about. And we'll share the recording um, of this presentation today, as well as um, future kind of video. Um, obviously, we had a really wonderful tour from Leandro of the exhibit um, via webcam, but we'll, we'll have some more of that um, to share very soon. And we just really want to thank you all, um, all of our project partners in the museum, 
um, Museum de Tripoli and the, the Bibliothèque Municipale de Versailles for all of the wonderful and hard work, the long hours that we, um, during, you know, kind of, again, these difficult conditions, but really that kind of provided us uh, a way to work around the challenges and have a, a really rich collaboration. So we're so pleased um, that the exhibit finally opened. It happened um, <laughs> after all, all of the delays um, and just helping us to access these um, collections and research um, far and wide. And we're so ex excited to see how this project um, continues and, and look forward to share, um, to continue, continuing to share what we've learned with the Choctaw community. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, you guys have all shared some really uh, wonderful things. If anyone, you know, wants to jump in with a last word um, before we end, uh, you're welcome to do that. We do have, um, you know, a very nice comment in the chat um, uh, about just kind of the project. And I, I think that we're just, again, excited to share this with our community um, more going forward so that we can kind of have more of these exchanges and, and questions and just kind of um, continue to learn through this. So um, anything before we close that I missed? Um, thank you all and um, thank you for the questions and um, we look forward to um, sharing with this, this with you in the not too far, not too distant future. So um, we'll uh, take care and we will uh, share this with you very soon. Yako Ki, a merci. Thank you all for, for your work on this. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. <laughs> A bientôt. A bientôt.